So this is Daphne. Hi. And uh, I'm going to introduce her. Have a seat if you wish. She, she never listens usually to me, but today she's on her best behavior. I, uh, I was thinking a little bit about the Aspen Institute and what the Ideas Festival and this meeting in particular mean. And it really does offer us an opportunity to exchange ideas uh, in a comfortable environment. Not physically comfortable, though it's that as well, but emotionally, intellectually comfortable. So you can talk about things quite openly and honestly. And, and that allows you to get into the nitty gritty of where the real challenges are in life, where the rubber meets the road. And so when we first started talking about this larger program, Several months ago, uh, Michelle, Michelle McMurray and other members of the group uh, started voicing concerns that much of the information we're talking about was going to be aimed at a group of people that aren't here, which are kids. And it turns out there are a lot of kids here. And by kids, I'll speak about people who are in transition in life. Not necessarily how old you are, but you know, you're going from point A to point B, but you're not at point B yet. And in fairness, as you grow older, for the younger ones, members of the audience, you'll realize you never get to point B, which is part of the fun. But uh, there are certainly a time when people expect you to be traveling from point A to point B. And that's a transition phase where we have not excelled in this country. Uh, the childhood obesity rates are just an example of that, although uh, it's one that's pretty compelling because it has significant health ramifications. So Daphne, uh, to introduce her, is the oldest of our four daughters, my wife Lisa, who's the source of all the key information. By the way, you'll notice common commentaries between, Lisa, between Daphne and I, and the reason is that neither of us thought of, of them. They're from my wife. Uh, and maybe I'll get her to say a few words later on. But Daphne was the oldest uh, of our four kids. She was born when I was in medical school. And I could go through the, the, uh, the trials and tribulations of raising her, but to share her the embarrassment of that and uh, the opportunity for, for rebutting them. I'm just going to skip to the chase, which was uh, that she ended up matriculating uh, at university and realizing during the course of her four years in college that there were many insights that, that had been absorbed during her upbringing by her that she didn't feel many of her classmates had. And more importantly, those are really the fundamental reasons why so many of these kids were losing their way because they had had the baton passed to them as they left home, but it had been dropped or it wasn't the right baton or it was for the baton for the wrong race. And if you think about it, for all of us, there is that that dangerous period of time, there are several of them. One is when you're first released as an egg from your mother's ovary and you're making that transition into the fallopian tube. You know, you know, you're just gravity carrying you there. God knows why it even works. That's pretty dangerous. Uh, but there's a, seemingly, a similar list this period when you finish your, your uh, high school uh, period and then you, for, you either enter into the workforce or go to college. And so she started to think about that in a meaningful fashion. And uh, I must say that although the dorm room diet, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, it was one of the reasons that we are doing this seminar, it's not the only reason. The, bigger, the broader goal was to look more widely at what it is we need to think about as we pass the baton to the next generation, where are the, the motivating factors and where are the, the pain points, the lever points to affect change. And I'll also say at the outset that I was not allowed to look at the, the book she wrote, the dorm room diet, until she was done, because she quite honestly told me that I would have messed it up. And I think she probably was right. And uh, for those of you who are, have an interest, you'll see uh, quite clearly it's a very different voice than mine. But I think it also speaks to her confidence that the voice of a 49-year-old wouldn't resonate to a 15, 16, 20, 25-year-old. Uh, and I think that's an important message for all of us to remember. So, Daphne. By the way, lots of questions to follow. She, Daphne is going to talk for 15, 20 minutes or so uh, uh, broadly about her, her thoughts. I have some questions that uh, have been generated from people here at the conference. There's, over the web, but I really wanted this event to be informal, have each of you throw questions up uh, that we can help address for you. So, Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming out. I know it's raining and we're in beautiful Aspen. You have other things to be doing, but um, I'm here to talk first a bit about my book, The Dorm Room Diet, and why I, as a college freshman when I wrote it, was credentialed in the slightest to be issuing diet advice. Um, and one thing I'd like to start by talking about is something that we've addressed in a couple of the panels that I have been to in the day today and yesterday, was this idea that in America especially, we're so educated, we have so much information available to us, and now with globalization, we have the internet, we have endless supplies of the right things to do, and yet somehow we all are struggling in some way or another with a, a lack of a way to apply that information. And the way that I, oops, oh my gosh, I forgot about that. Um, the way that I uh, saw that most prominently was in the obesity epidemic that we face today in America, particularly in a younger population. And I counted myself a num um, well, I wasn't obese necessarily, but I'll get to that in a second. 
Um, from the ages of 2 to 17, I was a good 35 to 40 pounds overweight. And as you can see from both my parents who are here, I came from a very healthy family. We were very health conscious. My mother was a vegetarian and, and raised us on you know, lean proteins, tofu, fish on occasion, because my dad is Mediterranean and demanded that we have some bronzini or something or other every once in a while. Um, but a lot of pastas, a lot of salads, a lot of starches, which are the vegetarian equivalent of a fatty steak. Um, and I really lacked portion control. Um, and so I struggled with this weight for quite a, quite a while. It was very interesting to me to see, uh, or it was rather a little bit alarming to see that I could come from such a healthy background. And I literally could not have asked for a more um, medically predominated family to come from. My grandfathers are both heart surgeons. My dad's a heart surgeon. My, all the females in my family are related to health in one way or another. Um, but I almost didn't feel the pressure to change because the externals were always telling me I was fine the way that I was. You know, it would, my dad would tell me, oh, it would be great if you could exercise a bit more, or eat healthier, because he could tell that being overweight was affecting me physically, but also emotionally, even though I was in denial for a period. Um, but at the time, you know, I, I was in high school, I was enjoying myself, I'd had boyfriends, I was in all honors classes. I, was, I felt on paper to be very successful. And it wasn't until my senior year of, co of high school, rather, that we had to create this thing called a senior page. And I'd only included pictures of myself before the age of five. And that was a little bit depressing <laughs> because this was supposed to be something, you know, to commemorate your experience in high school. And I, you know, there was a picture of me as a three-year-old on a beach in Florida, you know, in a costume for Halloween when I was seven. And it just, it wasn't reflective of who I had become. And I was... Uh, shocked and jarred to attention by the fact that I was ashamed of who I'd become even though I'd been in denial of that fact. So from uh, about January of my senior year of high school to my matriculation at Princeton in the fall, I lost 10 pounds. And I did that by simply beginning to become conscious of what I was putting in my mouth. I stopped treating food as a crutch. I stopped treating food as a a, you know, a way to bond and socialize. It became much more about fuel and much more about a way to enjoy those things that I felt were worth the indulgence, but really put them back in perspective. They weren't controlling me anymore. I really wanted to have college as the onset of my adult life mark the optimum me coming into existence. I wanted to be fit. I wanted to have my mental resilience be there. I found that, you know, when I was in, when I was in high school and I would run off to school and I'd have a great breakfast at home because of course my mom was you know, kind enough to make me something wonderful. Um, and then I'd get to the cafeteria for lunch and I'd scarf down some white bread and some fried something or other and a blondie or two and it just, you know, by the end of that, by the end of that lunch period, by the next class that I was going into, I was exhausted. I was craving my next sugary carb, carbohydrate fix and it was, it was really limiting me from being the best in school. It was also limiting me on the sports field. I played three varsity sports throughout high school and it was impossible for me to keep up on the sports team because I would be winded after you know five minutes of play. And I wanted college to be nothing like that. I wanted to set myself up for 100% success. Um, so I, you know, going to college, I realized, um, though I'd crafted some habits for myself while still at home, I, I've been afforded the luxury of having a full fridge, a parent, you know, a couple of parents to shop for me, um, you know, the, the, the nice foods that people provide for you when you're under their, their stewardship. And going away to school marked a completely different environment. And I found that, and I wasn't alone in this struggle, oh, there I go again. I wasn't alone in that struggle. I really felt like my peers wanted to learn about ways that they could take back their health, that they could you know, hold on to good habits they learned at home, but really lose the bad ones they might have picked up and start making some new ones for themselves that could last them a lifetime and really set them up for uh, a life of happiness and healthiness. So I began to find ways to avoid the five, the things that I identified as the five danger zones of college. And I looked for ways to make sure that I was getting the full experience, but also that I was not you know, limiting myself in any way, whether that meant by overindulging or not allowing myself to indulge in anything and feeling deprived. Um, and now, four years later, four, three years after the publication of this book, um, I've lost all 35 pounds and have been able to keep it off. And it hasn't been a, 
it has never been or felt to me like a diet in the way that we typically think of the word as in a, a going away from the norm or you know a, we, we go on a diet like we're going on a trip. It's become a serious part of my life, but it's become a subconscious part of my life almost now because it's, it's ingrained and it's become a way of a way of making smart decisions on a daily basis that I think people can learn from and that I think what was so useful about this book was that I wrote it when I was of the age of the people I was writing for. I think that's what really resonated and that was the feedback that I'd gotten. So we, some of the material that uh, Daphne used uh, as she began to craft these ideas, we used as a foundation for Health Corps, which is a, a nonprofit that seeks to teach kids about their bodies. And although, although oftentimes the excuse you use to get to a kid is, I want you to, to take better care of your body, what you're really trying to do is get the kids to learn about mental resilience on how to be tough enough up here so they can deal with the world outside. And if you can't control your own body, you, how can you possibly control the world outside of it? And so frequently the obesity that we see in the adult population, and I'm curious if you think this is the case in kids as well, is because the adults have lost control. They've lost control of their, their personal life, they've lost control of their workplace, they've lost control of the vision of where they want to go. And so the only thing they control is a spoon in their hand and the plate that it shovels into. And so when you think through that as an adult, you begin to realize that that has oftentimes some uh, connection to what drives you. I'm curious, what, what, what usually do you think causes the weight gain if the freshman 15? Well, I think that, like I said, call it a unique environment. Um, and I think that that's because for most kids, you're going away on your own for the first time and you are subject to social pressures that you might not have been before and you're trying to <clears throat> forge for yourself basically an entirely new existence and identity um, you know, all without the support of a loving family necessarily right nearby. Um, and I think that the reason that that leads to weight gain is because on the one hand you're really nervous about seeming like you know, being ostracized for particularly stringent eating habits. So you don't want to be known as the girl or the guy who can't eat anything or you know has all these specific restrictions that they have. Um, but I think it's also late night partying, um, you know, study breaks, uh, eating while you're studying in general is a bad idea because you're so distracted and you're not actually thinking, like you said, mindless shoveling of food to you know, food to mouth. And I think that those were some of the things that I really found my peers struggled with. If they hadn't previously decided, I'm going to be conscious when I eat, I'm going to make a conscious decision to eat this or not eat this, and whether what you consume is a healthy item or not healthy item is a completely s separate issue because when you determine your lifestyle, when you set the rules for the game, you're always winning. You're just allowing yourself some leeway here and there. And I think that's where you can really come, in, come into contact with this idea that it's not about losing control. We don't want control over what we're doing every day in terms of you don't want to necessarily feel like you have to put everything in line or everything will fall out of place, but you want enough things in line that you have structure, that you have room for mobility within it. What kind of feedback did you get from classmates and other kids that you went? By the way, when you, did, you did a road trip. Yeah. Explain that to everybody and then talk about some of the feedback you got. Sure. So, I, this, I wrote this during my freshman year of college, but it actually didn't come out until the fall of my junior year. And so I was right in the middle of junior, junior papers, which are you know, a big term paper that we do in the fall semester. So I couldn't take time off to do a huge book tour, but I did go every weekend to a different Northeastern school and um, speak with the student body there, oftentimes to like, a varsity athletic team or to um, a bookstore, a campus talk. Um, and the, the response that was very interesting, I found, because you know, I did, of course, the Ivy Leagues, and I found that the people who turned up there, literally maybe four people to every talk. It was, I was giving, I was talking to myself, um, and I realized, I realized that I'd made a trip for nothing, but also that, um, that it was because a lot of these kids, I felt, had either grown up in a, you know, metropolis, and they felt very cosmopolitan, they felt like they already had the information, um, and mm, they kind of were, a little bit condescending about learning something from up here. Um, whereas when I went to schools in the South and in the Midwest, and which I think were primarily where my, where my books were most popular, people were you know, avaricious for this information. They were desperate for it. And they really, I think, clicked with the idea that health didn't have to be intimidating. Eating well didn't have to be hard. It didn't have to mark this huge departure from your normal life. You could still enjoy fried chicken or a cake or whatever it was that you wanted, but you could do it in moderation and still enjoy yourself. So just to make it granular for everybody, 
give me what a day at school would look like. Sure. T typically for you. Day at school would look like. Get up at 10. Well, wait, oh, this is, this is actually, <laughs> you know, I, I, he, I, I, no, 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 I want to tell this story. <laughs> he gets to tell this story all the time and it's so false. My dad's, my dad's rendition of the story was that he calls me innocently at 10 in the morning after completing three surgeries, you know, <laughs> lifesaver, and, 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 and says, proceed, and launch, my dad, I don't know if any of you have ever spoken to him on the phone, does not use, you know, the regular formalities, hey, how are you? What are you doing? Like immediate militia, you know, calls to arm, and and I think the question of the day was something like, you know, how do I apply to my summer internship or something? It was September. I mean, it was really, really in advance, and and, and I said I, I couldn't even comprehend what he was saying, and I said, what time is it? What did you say? No, he said, do you have any idea what time it is? And I say, yeah, it's about ten after ten. I said, are you kidding me? She knows it's true. So anyway, she gets up at 10 after 10, misses breakfast, and we paid for it. We're going No. For, How many I mean, parents out there know that feeling? You know, you pay full room and board, and they, you know, they eat one meal, maybe. I know that feeling. <laughs> um, no, I, I actually um, had, had got, um, gotten a refrigerator in my room with my roommates, so we kept a lot of yogurt and hard fruits around. Um, so I'd wake up, I'd have some yogurt with granola, and then I'd run off to class, which I was always late for. And... Um, and then, I, did you know that? I, I would be in class for like two hours in the morning. Um, yes, I did go to class. <laughs> and, and for lunch, I would have generally my biggest meal lunch because I'm, I, I'm not that hungry close to when I wake up. <laughs> and so I would have a, a large lunch. I'd have a sandwich and a salad or you know, something, something substantial with some carbohydrates and some protein and a lot of fiber, because I, um, I make sure to have fiber in every meal, because I think that that was what really helped me stay satiated. Then I'd have a snack in the afternoon, um, something with peanut butter usually, um, or uh, I love to make chocolate dipped strawberries, because I am a chocoholic, and I found that you could get the taste of chocolate, but still have the fiber and the nutrition of strawberry in there, and you didn't have quite as much to go through. Um, and then for dinner, I made sure to keep it very light. I had, I had you know, a protein, but it no, not with any like cheesy sauces or anything like that. And I had a salad and some vegetables, and I'd try to skip dessert unless we were out to like a nice dinner. But I think that that was a pretty, um, I was lucky because my campus was very ahead of its time, I thought, in doing a lot of healthy options. So we always had a, we had a grill, which could always make you grilled meats. Um, we had a, um, like a teriyaki bar where they could make you sauteed vegetables all the time. We had a huge salad bar, we had a, a cereal bar. So you really had a diverse array of things available to you. And one of the things that really helped me stay on track, especially in the first semester, is I, I found like the first day I went into the, to the buffet style cafeteria, you walk in and it's like, ah, you know, everything's around you and everything's free and it's just like, you know, a kid in a candy shop. And I would watch people literally coming back and forth with just tray after tray of things, going back to their table, they'd be stacking things on, like things falling off. There was always a splatter of mess on the floor because people just didn't know how to deal with this overwhelming amount of food available to them. And so I made a pact with myself that I would only take what I could fit on my tray, and I would never send people back to get food for me. I would go by myself. You'd be amazed how much laziness is a deterrent to eating more than you actually want to. Um, and I would also make sure to know that, you know, if I had the grilled cheese today, I didn't need to have it tomorrow. Or if I had a menu on the, an item on the menu today, I didn't need to have it next week. Because menus repeat, and you know that it will always be available to you. So as you think back, and I'm curious if others in the room think this as well, I'm always impressed at how much effort schools spend on addressing addictions and alcoholism, cigarettes. They don't seem to spend nearly as much time on the issue of food. Certainly probably plays a bigger role in how you perform in classes than whether or not you went out uh, for a couple beers at night. I think that's absolutely true. I think that um, here who, who took a look around their college campus groups, you would see an overwhelming array of substance abuse programs or sexual health programs or you know, after school groups, student unions, whatever it was. I don't know, I'm curious to know how many of you had a sustainable agriculture group or a um, you know, healthy living group or even a cooking class group, because I think that those would have been classes that I would certainly have been drawn to and that I would have felt <clears throat> much better prepared as I entered college and eventually entered the workforce. And, and all, of the, all of these lessons can be taken with you after you leave school and you become a young adult and you're in your first apartment and you're trying again to readjust to a new environment, a new location. Um, 
I find that on college campuses, a couple of things. You know, one is that um, it's expensive. It's expensive to have healthier food options available to you, available to a, a huge number of students. Um, and it's also maybe a less sexy topic to talk about than um, pre preventing gonorrhea. Um, but, but I do think that, that uh, college, colleges and universities and higher learning institutions in general have a huge amount of potential to affect the way that we as Americans view food and view the responsibility that each of us as citizens has to make food a priority and to make healthy living and healthy eating a priority, not just for people who can afford to eat whatever it is that's available in the organic section of Whole Foods, but what, what should be available on a mass level. And I think that colleges with their, first of all, educational missions, but also with their huge buying power. I mean, colleges last year spent $4 billion on food alone. I mean, that's, that's something that can really be dedicated to some high quality food, especially when you think about the fact that a, a couple out in, the mid, out in the Midwest and Northwest especially, um, a couple of the huge suppliers of foods to campuses have partnered with organic certifiers and found ways to provide sustainable, local, seasonal agriculture from around the college campuses to provide that food to the college students on a daily basis, which is wonderful. You're getting access to this local food that's so much more nutritious. And frankly, it's a lot cheaper to provide because you don't have those, those food miles that they travel from Guatemala and wherever right. else. How, how many, anybody out there is within five years of college? What, what you guys have in... Uh, tell me, did you have programs in class? No, no, no. I'm going to college. You're going to college. All right. So it's not, no, you don't, you don't get, you're, you'll learn then next year. <laughs> Anybody who's within a couple years of college who may be out there, yes. Nothing, did, yet. nothing yet. And did, did they have, but they had programs for drugs and? Yeah. Uh, talks and speakers. Talks and speakers. Right. Anything on greening, on uh, local produce? Was there a farmer's market that would swing by periodically? No. Same as we had in the back. Yes. You know, is there a mic we can transport around? Is there, if there's one extra one? Give me one second. While they're getting you a mic, let me just... Uh, you know, and after that, I, I wanted to sort of probe into this whole campus movement and the power we have of harvesting the youth and maybe get into the whole uh, concept of social media and what role that might play in helping spread the word Definitely. more effectively. Go, go ahead. What's your well, name, by the way? What we were saying about the farmer's markets yeah. like Saturday morning because I'm healthy Good. and I did lose. I went to Central America and I lost like 13 pounds. Which is, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm allergic to wheat, so it's really hard for me to find things, foods to eat. And I of see course. kids eating like French fries and stuff. I'm like, you know what's going to happen to you when you eat this stuff. Right. So just thinking about preparing food. And I was like so jealous when you said that they, they prepare meats. So when I go into the cafeteria some nights, I only get protein two out of seven nights a week, and I eat salad the rest of the night. So I'm, I'm exhausted when I go to bed. Oh, my gosh. See, so yeah, I eat salads a lot at school because the food there is just, it's cooked and it's breaded. And before I even go in, I'm like, is it breaded? Because I won't go in. Right. Yeah. So I just think that food could be, they could provide jobs, and they could actually cook the food at school. And I, and I, I go to Ohio Wesleyan, so it's in the Midwest. So you have access to it. I have, there's numbers. access. Yeah. There's farms around school where they could like part, partner with and yeah. get meat. That's it. Could have people cook the food. Do they school. have a farmers market on Wesleyan campus? They have it every Saturday morning, but it's not like a huge farmers market. Yeah. Like, I live in a really small town, so. Yeah. Why don't you talk a little bit about social media and how that could uh, help this education? Because anyway, I think the movement that needs to occur when people understand at least a, a path or, or generate a vision. Uh, for where they're going needs to be communicated that way. And if someone can get the mic over here, this gentleman in the blue shirt, I was going to ask him a follow-up question. I'll introduce him in a second. Go ahead. Sure. So when I published this in 2006, um, Twitter obviously wasn't around yet, and I hadn't thought of Facebook as a, a marketing tool. Um, but I did uh, put up a couple ads, like just some banners or whatever it was, literally minimal effort. And within a year of its publication date, it had received hundreds of testimonials, of responses from people who'd taken the time to find me on Facebook, friend me, and send me a message saying that, you know, I found this book to be enlightening and that it, it made, finally made health information 
translatable, accessible, it made it possible for me to implicate it in my own life immediately. These were all things that I couldn't deal with before because all the diet books I had seen, you know, required me to make egg white frittatas every morning and you just can't do that with a, a crock pot. Um, so, so it, and that was so rewarding because it was amazing to me to see the kind of action that these people took. You know, they read a book, they thought, wow, I, w I want to learn more. And inevitably, these, these um, messages would ask for new information, they'd ask for recipes. I'm actually doing a revised version right now that includes gluten and lactose intolerance as a chapter and, um, and recipes and testimonials. Um, because of the demand people had for, you know, what can I do within the confines of my dorm? Because um, I, I did address, you know, exercising in a 10 by 10 room, supplementing, getting relaxation, you know, having, having time to yourself, all of these things you can do within your dorm room. How do I make a healthy meal? That's something that I'm struggling with. Um, but it was, just, it was just amazing to me, the fact that, that through that kind of, you know, small, small website, Facebook was small then, it's not small anymore, people could link together and find people, and I would, I would connect people to each other, and they, if they were in the same area, they, could, they formed like little health unions and little health groups, and they would share recipes, and it just was fascinating to me, the kind of viral marketing that occurred as a result. So I'm gonna ask if I could, Jeff Arnold, who's uh, sitting over, Jeff started a small company called WebMD, um, but he's uh, taught me a lot about social marketing. We talk a lot about health issues, and I just wanted to share if you have a few insights about w what we can do to talk to a population that's already speaking to each other quite aggressively to build community around some of these ideas. Um, well, um, as Daphne said, that you know, you've seen all these enabling technologies and I mean, really evolve. So when we started uh, WebMD in 1998, it was uh, very much um, a singular point of view. So, you know, how could you build a brand that, uh, such as WebMD that stood for quality health information, but we were limited to how many people we could invite into the conversation. And as you've looked at the recent explosion of the Twitters and the Facebooks and the MySpaces and the YouTubes of the world or the Wikipedias, you've started to see how multiple points of view coming together in one place can really build strong community both locally and globally. And um, you know, one of the things that I've been able to learn um, over the last year talking with Dr. Oz is this concept of um, multiple points of view, so, um, which Facebook really has taken advantage of in the last 12 months. But, you know, how do you truly answer the questions of health? How do you become a smart patient? And take that singular format, which could be a question and answer format, but invite multiple points of view so that it's easy for the consumer to come in and hear what Dr. Oz might have to say as a physician, to hear what the Cleveland Clinic might have to say, to hear what local caregivers might have to say, such as doctors or nutritionists or physicians or caregivers or people who are dealing with conditions, and not have to play the ping pong that you often play with Google today, where you, you, know, you ask a question to Google in the form of a keyword, and it takes you to a website, that makes you think of something else. You go back to Google, you ask another question, and you're forced to kind of piece it all together. And so, um, so we're working on this idea of, you know, how do you share care by creating a kind of a question and answer format, which the premise is how do you um, ask and answer the questions of health, but more importantly, how do you get multiple points of view on that and let the community govern itself and let the best answers kind of rise to the top and let the user determine what voice resonates best to them so that they can start to not only um, have an ongoing conversation with the person who's given that answer, but also start to group themselves with people like themselves so together they can create change um, through community. Thanks very much, Jeff. So because uh, I think part of the, the challenge we're all going to face is how do you get the word out? And the kids, uh, th these, my kids, uh, don't seem to read the same things I read and or even use the same technologies I use. And that's why I'm sort of curious about what form this will take, but I suspect it'll be much faster uh, uh, as this progresses. Kristen. They can use, the, use the mic if you don't mind. And you know what I'm gonna ask is a, fa a favor. As soon as she's done asking the question, put your hands up. Who has, not, who has another question? If anybody, good, right here. So as soon as you're done, if you could just bring the question to the next person, I'll let you choose. And that way we will uh, be seamless, go ahead. So here's my question. As someone who has nieces and really the nieces struggle more than the nephews, how can we bring to them yet without, you know, you don't want to hurt them, you don't, what can we do just from peer to peer to be encouraging? Well, how old are your nieces now? Um, 
anywhere from 8 to 16. Oh, wow, okay. So moving into that. Yeah, age. certainly. Well, I think that I think that the way that I best, even just through osmosis, before I even recognized I was learning these things, was by the good example set by my family members. I think that's something you can definitely do right from the get-go. I think it's also important, especially if you're dealing with kids entering a transition time where they have the potential to really go off the deep end, but they also have this freedom that allows them to harness that and use it for good and establish good habits and make those last in the lifetime. I think it's really important to let them have that learning experience because other, Keep going. Oh, sure. otherwise, um, otherwise it just it, it seems forced. And like what I, what I was saying from my testimonial was I couldn't, I couldn't change, I couldn't make the necessary lifestyle adjustments that I had to make to make this a lasting change if it were coming from the outside only. It had to be something that I wanted for myself. And I think that you learn to want that for yourself when you see something as jarring as the fact that you only like pictures of yourself before the age of seven, or you know, in, your niece, in your niece's examples, like maybe they're suffering on a sports team or whatever it might be, they're gonna see that for themselves and it will, re and will click and will resonate. And once they have that epiphany moment, it's gonna be important that they have you as a resource to reach out to. And uh, this afternoon you did, and uh, <clears throat> after you did, uh, that it's expensive to eat healthy. And uh, could you, either of you, elaborate a little bit? Because I suppose if you think of it as a business issue, that's a barrier, right? So what, if anything, uh, uh, are your thoughts about trying to lower the cost? I guess I'll start. I, I'm more um, impassioned about this than I should maybe as an outside observer. But I do think that there's something inherently wrong with the fact that the only foods that are available to us en masse happen to be the ones that are really high calorie and very low nutritional value. Um, and I think that a lot, I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with, um, I learned about this this morning actually, with depression era uh, agricultural practices. So we started subsidizing corn and row crops, which are corn and grain and those kinds of items, because it, we needed desperately, as, as we entered World War II, to sustain a, f a food supply that would be permanent, that we could store long term, and that we could give out and ship to people across the country. Now, fortunately, we're not dealing with Depression era or, war, or World War era food needs. We have, you know, we're never going to be entering a time of famine in the near future, but we still maintain these practices of needing to have a constant supply of abundant variety of foods that people expect to be able to have on a daily basis. I, I personally think it's unreasonable to be able to expect that you could eat a, you know, a double patty hamburger for 99 cents. It's just there are hidden costs in there that the average American taxpayer is covering, whether it be through, you know, through subsidies that the, that the government provides or um, even things that we, that we tend to think of as intangibles that you can't quantify, like, like pollution or you know, if there were a CO2 tax, maybe you could, but it, you know, whatever it might be, methane gas emissions from the cows, these are things that we're going to have to come to, come, to, come to grips with at some point or another. And I think that to deal with the issue of food as being expensive and certain foods being more expensive than others, we really need to level the playing field. There needs to be an, uh, you know, an equal chance for producers of vegetables and fruits, which, which we haven't allowed yet, which we haven't made available to people to have as an option because we've so levied the cards in one, in one basket and not the other. People, of course, are going to buy. If you, can, if you could eat two hamburgers for the price of a, of a red pepper, of course you're going to buy the hamburgers. You can feed a small family on the cost of, of, a, of a salad. And I think that that is something that American citizens are going to have to start demanding that we have, a, that we have access to these items at a reasonable price, at the price that they actually are, not at the price that we've created them to be. Um, and only then are the producers going to actually change and shift their policies. I, I think if you, if you look at places in the world where people live, and we, we did a show with Oprah this year called The Blue Zone Show. And blue zones were developed by demographers who would look at populations and how they aged, and they would draw different color circles around people who come from an area where death happens early versus late. And the blue circles were the places where people lived the longest. And so we went to four of these places. These are places where the chance of living to age 100 is four times greater than if you live in the United States. It was Costa Rica. It was Sardinia in Italy. It was Okinawa in Japan. The fourth blue zone was Loma Linda in the United States. And I was sort of struck by that because as I went through these places, I realized that the food 
was remarkably where, where, Loma Linda. Where is that? It's just it's just east of Los Angeles. It's about 60 miles east of Los Angeles. It's in the valley. And uh, I, I was struck as I visited Costa Rica, for example, how inexpensive the food really was that they were eating. I mean, they're basically beans and rice, or, or they have rice and beans. You know, <laughs> they mix it up. And there are some things they have that they're a little bit lucky. And they have they have pretty hard water, which means they've got calcium in the water. And, Calcium happens to be something that's pretty valuable to have in your body if you can have it with vitamin D, which they also have from the sun. And, you know, so there are some things that go beyond basic food, but the food supply was a primarily vegan selection with some meat. Now, Sardinia, they actually did eat meat, but again, the, the meat that they ate was, was a typical meat that we would have eaten hundreds of years ago with a 9% fat content versus, versus the 30% plus that we normally have from a nice, well-marbled piece of beef you'll eat now. But, and meat was always a, an accoutrement. It wasn't a foundation element of the diet. And, and uh, I went to Loma Linda and, and I saw something that was in this country successful. Now, in Loma Linda, the primary religious group is the Seventh-day Adventists and they're vegetarians. And I bring this up again because when we look across all populations, people who are thin live longer and people who are vegetarians live longer in general. I mean, they're, you know, obviously we're all going to live different amounts depending on multiple factors. But in Loma Linda, the food was really cheap. And it was cheap because the community would buy in bulk large amounts of food. When you buy beans in Loma Linda, it's a vat the size of the stage. And you put your shovel in there and you get your beans and off you go. You're not paying for packaging or marketing or anything else. It's just, and everyone sort of expects that's how it's going to be sold. So, uh, and by the way, they had I mean, a room bigger than this of beans. And every kind of bean you've ever heard, lima beans, juju beans, you know, you know, you could play games with these beans. It was remarkable. And they all came, again, these big bins that you could just shovel out what you wanted. And I think we need to revisit how we package and, 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 and market foods. Because when we put them in those little bitty plastic bags, yeah, you can charge anything you want to charge on it. And food is much more expensive in the inner city because those vendors aren't going to do it without making that profit margin. And they're not selling high-end products whatsoever. So lastly, to the issue of of the farm policy. So Senator Harkin, who leads the agricultural committee, is from Iowa. And he's an outspoken critic of our agricultural policies, which is ironic. It's a very brave thing for him to do. But he is outspoken about it because he realizes how wrong it is to pay people to grow things that they normally wouldn't want to grow. And I, I can't prove this statistic, but I've heard it uh, more than once. But if we did not subsidize the food in this country, a pound of meat would cost us $90. And you wouldn't be eating a lot of it. And we were speaking earlier, as we were coming over, about the fact that it, it, it's probably important for us to start having higher prices for some foods so that people don't take advantage of subsidies that make foods that aren't ecologically sensible um, and, and create huge imbalances uh, and, uh, and prevent them from selling at the magnitude that they sell now. If we were all eat meat as a small little accoutrement to our, or you know, flavoring, so to speak, of our meal, rather than the big main course and they put some boiled vegetables next to it, it would begin to shift behaviors. It would also begin to make paying $1.99 for a you know, green pepper something that you might think is actually rational. And I think we've gotten comfortable as a nation buying in bulk things of low value. It's the Walmart movement, and we do it all the time. You buy things you don't want and more of them because it's inexpensive that way, but you actually don't get what you really need for a price that may have been the same price although it seems the value would be less because you're getting less of it. I think it's a, that's part of us growing up uh, and our food policy matching it. Other thoughts? Yes, sir. Hello. If you just give your name, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Vlad, V-L-A-D. How are you? Vlad. <laughs> so uh, I've struggled with my weight a little bit in my 20s. I've traveled a lot, and I count myself eating in restaurants, and even if I try to eat just a little bit, it starts to pack on, and you've got all these soups that have all the extra fat, they add all the sodium, et cetera, et cetera. So I decided that I wanted to follow the... Okinawa type diet or the Costa Rica I started buying cans and it was amazing how the pounds just melted away mm -hmm. sweet peas uh, green beans and then like a small piece of uh, of, of a chicken breast organic right. was like just a couple of bucks right. and it was unbelievable oatmeal in the morning a bunch of cans of peas for like 99 cents <laughs> with no salt added and it was, it, was, um, it, was, it was amazing I mean it was just it was simple foods no added ingredients to the cans, and just pounds just start melting away. It's really something. Well, I can just offer one statistic to support what you're saying. The, uh, the long-term studies on weight loss that have been done, Vlad, have shown one resounding reality. 
And it's not about how much protein or carbohydrates or, or fat are in your diet. It's not about whether they're, you know, omega-3 fats versus trans fats. The one reality in all long-term trials on weight loss is that they're all about 100 calories a day, difference from what you normally eat. And why is that? Because when you try to lose 400 calories, then your body immediately begins to sense that it's starving. The metabolism shuts down almost immediately. You begin to lose not just fat, but muscle mass. As you lose muscle mass, now you lose metabolic rate. And then as you get frustrated because you're not losing weight, because your metabolism is slowed down to catch up to the calorie restriction you're in, now you yo-yo back up again. But this time you go past your baseline weight because you don't have the muscle mass to keep churning off the calories. And so we see this process going over and over again. The interesting thing about going to plant-based diets is you put a lot of food in your stomach, as you all know. And yet you don't have the impact of the rich foods, which are calorically dense, nutritionally depleted, which I think so many of the poor in our country especially, but all of us sometimes mistakenly to use. And they did a little, just a short story. They, they, one of the city councilmen in New York City decided that he was going to live on food stamps. The food stamps are $28 a week. So he went on food stamps, and he gained three pounds in one week. Because you can't buy food for $28 unless you buy the foods Daphne was mentioning. Calorically dense, nutritionally depleted. Thoughts? I was just thinking about um, the fact that when you when humans often like to eat on habit because it removes any of the decision making process i think eating out of can knowing what you were going to eat every day you have oatmeal in the morning you have cans for lunch you were going to have you know a small bit of protein it made it simple it took the difficulty of making a tough choice of healthy or unhealthy out of the equation and i think that probably would would help everyone to lead a little bit of a healthier life what were some of the criticisms you faced from the book um, well, actually, a funny thing before I get to the Christians of the book. Um, do you remember when you made me make that fun workout video? <laughs> yes. We did something called the dorm room diet workout. Um, and I somehow coerced my sister and an ex-boyfriend <laughs> to do the demonstrations for it. And I only did the introduction. And um, the main criticism I faced was that I could lose 10 pounds if I just cut off my hair. Um, which I thought was unfair. <laughs> um, but uh, with the book, I think um, people were, people were, especially from what I learned from the Facebook message I mentioned earlier, people really wanted recipes, and I hadn't taken time to include enough of those in the book because I wasn't quite sure, you know, I wasn't sure how a book would do. I wasn't sure if people would be interested to learn from someone who didn't have an MD or a PhD after their name. And, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that it turned out people did, and people always want to learn. I think there's a thirst for knowledge in our nation, especially that, and especially among young people, especially when they're entering um, a transition phase, like I mentioned, where they're really open to change and they're open to challenge. Um, and now I realize that I would love to include more of the, of the recipe chapters, and I think also um, some testimonials would have been helpful. Uh, Towards the end of the book, you included some material on spirituality and sort of the, the broader themes of maturation that we often don't focus on much uh, at your age. Why did you decide to do that, and what were some of the tips you offered? So this was something that was really important to me, um, and I named the book The Dorm Room Diet, as my publisher, who's here with me today, can tell you, um, because I like the alliteration, and I thought it was interesting because it really hit this target population. Um, of collegiates, but it's not a diet in the typical sense. It was never meant to be um, a, a stringent program that you went on for a couple of weeks and lost a hundred pounds on and then went off. Um, it really was about creating a healthy lifestyle. And as part of that, I felt it imperative that I focus on physical health. So I had a chapter on nutrition. I had a chapter on navigating the danger zones of college. But I also wanted to talk, and I had exercise chapters, of course, but I wanted to talk about um, mental health and emotional health as well. And for those, I included a chapter on Supplementation. I, my family is really big into vitamins and natural remedies and, and all different kinds of sort of alternative medicine therapies um, that I had always found very useful and had always had people asking me about, so I thought were important to include in the book. And I also did a chapter that was my personal favorite called um, How to Get Happy. And it was basically talking about finding center and finding purpose in your life. And what that meant wasn't you know, finding religion necessarily, but it was in some, to some degree about spirituality. It was about feeling like the world didn't, you know, the sun didn't set and rise on your existence. You, and that I think, you know, sounds maybe a little condescending, but it's also 
really important, I think, for young people to recognize that they can make mistakes, they can have failures in life, and no one will come to a screeching halt and think that they're a social pariah and leave them in the dust. It happens to everyone, and the people who are the most successful learn from those mistakes. Um, and I think that I think that having a purpose in life and having friends around you to be supportive and having I talked a lot about you know getting involved in groups that could that could support you extra, in extracurriculars. So whether it was having a walking buddy or joining a cooking class or joining a reading group, whatever it was, having that social bond was really important. My dad talked about earlier today um, having you know, the the what was the the incidence of. Um, Cancer was dramatically reduced if you had people, oh no, the bankruptcy took eight years off your life unless you had a social network or a, a, a collective around you to support you and bolster you up, which I think is, a, is a, an amazing statistic at the resilience of humans, but only in the presence of, of purpose and centeredness. And, and yeah, that's good. So let me just play a little game. Actually, go, go, go with two, two questions, then I want you all to think about this. I'm going to go around the room, and I'd love to hear some of the best uh, tidbits of, uh, or advice you got as you left home. Because uh, for me, actually, this is much more about leaving home than going to college and what that transition uh, might have looked like in your life. So go ahead, ma'am. One, two, and then we'll just go around. Just a couple sporadic uh, points like that. Then I'll come back to Daphne. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name's Laura. Hi, Laura. Hi. Um, what I wanted to ask you was it's a little bit more of a complex question about kids and how they learn about food in the home. And I sort of see the parenting role as their job is to steward and care for the mind, body, and spirit of the child to help it develop to the best they can. And what I've seen a lot is I've bumped into parents or families where they say, oh, you know, Johnny will only eat mac and cheese, or he'll only eat hot dogs, or you know what, if he doesn't have ice cream, he just screams. And what I wanted to know is when did that shift, and I, what I've noticed is there's a guilt sometimes in parents. Maybe they married the wrong person and got divorced. Maybe they're working. And so what they choose is they choose to indulge and they stop saying no. It's almost like they're afraid to say no to their child. They want to be their child's friend. They want their child's approval. And while in the short term it might make alleviate their guilt, what they're not doing is they're not teaching their child about how to care for themselves. And I don't know when that shift happened because I don't know that it, this is the right way, but in my home my mom made one meal. And it's sort of like that's what was for dinner. We could take one bite of something. We couldn't turn our nose up at it. And, you know, I've seen people where they make seven meals for, you know, everybody. So I'm not sure. Food seems like a place where people alleviate their guilt. And nobody's really learned this is the right amount. This is what you should eat. Because they don't want to say no or upset their children. Like a temper tantrum is evidence of failure as a parent. Daphne, you can address that. And also talk a little bit about how you get siblings to start shifting behavior. So with all my kids, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think that. I think that that's absolutely pr correct. I think that parents, um, or at least my aunts and uncles, I've seen uh, children w uh, fearfully almost. Like they don't want to hurt them and they don't want to upset them. And I think that what I've seen is a creation of a child that's very sort of scared of the outside world and doesn't feel like they have boundaries, doesn't feel like they have any structure. But most importantly, their little bodies aren't having the nutrition that they need to really function and, and to grow. And I think that. That's the ultimate disservice. If you're not teaching your kids healthy, healthy foods and or the you know the benefits of healthy foods early on, how can you expect them to go later in life and, and alter all those habits that they've been grown, growing up with and suddenly make a healthy lifestyle for themselves all over again? Um, but speaking more to what I've done with my siblings, I think that I certainly I mean, my brother's 13 years younger than I am, so I don't think he was well aware of what I was going through. But I think my sisters definitely saw me struggling with how I could address my weight issues and be happy and feel fulfilled. And I think that um, it definitely set an example for them. It definitely set an example of personal empowerment and feeling like, you know what, you can be in a place where you're not happy with yourself and you don't have to hate yourself, you don't have to feel like a bad person, but you can make changes to make life better and to make, um, to make make it be all that you want it to be. And I think that that was really important. I think that growing up in our family was certainly a benefit in terms of you know having access to healthy foods and having knowledge about healthy foods and healthy living and alternative therapies. But I think that it's important, especially, I mean, I'm the eldest and I think I like to think that they look up to me and it's it's nice to feel like even if they don't ever struggle with their weight which I you know god willing they won't it's it's something it's a lesson that I think they will learn and take with them even if they don't aren't cognizant of it necessarily right now and just to throw a couple numbers at this 
Uh, the, the average time and times that a child tastes food, truly be able to discern if they like it or not, is about 12. And so there are many ways of getting a child to taste the food 12 times. Sometimes there's coercion and there's you know, subterfuge. And, but eventually, you've got to taste it 12 times. 12 is a lot. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of effort to, to get the kid to taste the radishes before one day they actually ask for the radishes. But if they don't taste it enough times, they won't get it. And kids, of course, have very selective taste buds for a reason. Because if we ate something that was bitter, let's say a leafy green vegetable, it's okay if it happens to be poisonous. But in general, those kinds of foods that are poisonous wouldn't be well tolerated by a, a small child, and which is why they tend to be very selective in what they eat. Same reason, by the way, that, that women get morning sickness when they're pregnant, because they have to be repulsed by anything that might be even potentially poisonous, because in that very fragile state, the fetus can't tolerate poisoning, even though the mother could. So we are hardwired as children not to desire taste. The problem, from my perspective, is not when five-year-olds want a Big Mac, Coke, and a fries. It's when a 35-year-old wants a Big Mac, Coke, and a fries. Because what we are doing, I think, in America is infantilizing our taste buds. You know, as they remain immature through adulthood, it becomes the norm to eat food. I don't know how many of you guys have gone to a fast food restaurant and gotten the Big Mac, hamburger, and fries, but I, it's hard to eat that if you actually are used to eating food that's real food. But if you're not, that becomes the norm. And, you know, what's, it, it, and because of that, it, it becomes adapted to you. And the other point I was going to make was, one that Martha Beck made to me, actually. We were doing a show together. And uh, this is the whole issue, of course, of how parents treat their kids in general. And it goes uh, beyond the scope of dieting, but it's reflective of it. Uh, but we were talking about parents trying to do the most for their kids and, and sacrificing themselves for their kids. And she made the very, uh, uh, as Martha does, I don't know how many of you know Martha, but she's really a very wise person. She's been through a lot in her own life, and she's worked out a lot of issues. She said, uh, kids don't treat themselves the way you treat them. They treat themselves the way you treat yourself. And so their role models are, are, are the, you, you, the parents. Uh, if you treat yourselves with pride, with self-esteem, and, and you don't uh, bend over too far to make life too easy for people around you, you actually set a better role model. And I think every time we give our kids something that we didn't have, we take away from our kids something we did have. And I'll say it again, because if, you know, if you give your kids money, as an example, and you didn't have it when you were growing up, you take away from them the opportunity to struggle that you had that made you who you are. And I struggle with that all the time. We were talking about that recently. You know, I figured these quotes out for her, by the way. But, yeah, but I think that's, these are important insights that all parents, when we really think at our deepest, uh, come back over and over. There's a question from over here. Yes, yes sir. At my alma mater and uh, my daughter's college, and junction to some degree with the Benson Henry Institute at Harvard mm -hmm. uh, in consulting. And when, one of the findings uh, you mentioned uh, emotional resilience or something like that, uh, that they link with the obesity and they link with sleep. And in these two universities, the absence of sleep seemed in the eyes of the, of the Institute uh, to be a factor in obesity. Now, there are complex group of relationships I don't uh, pretend to understand, but uh, the intervention that came out of that was moving classes back when they started and so forth, and uh, apparently there's it affects you emotionally, and I haven't heard much about sleep, for example, uh, in um, the forum here. But I think it's a I think it's a big factor in uh, obesity, and and then you get one of the foods that it, colleges uh, uh, kids eat, if you will, sure. young people, uh, is beer and alcohol. Uh, we haven't heard much about that, but I have a hunch from these two programs that that contributes to the obesity as well. So my, my, my point and kind of question is, is what do you see, if any, as the linkage between, you've touched on the emotional, but on sleep, for example, just take that variable. So I'll let you address the science aspect behind that. But I think, just speaking as someone who is a recent grad, when I haven't slept enough, my my immediate thought is to get whatever I can in my system that will give me the most energy or that's the easiest to access. And that's inevitably processed, high sugar, 
high sodium, high fat, whatever it might be, it's not going to be the healthiest option when you're running out the door or you're exhausted and you want that immediate boost of energy. Now, long term, that doesn't work very well, which means that all throughout the day, you're constantly fueling the cycle of, of a huge glycemic spike and then, or, uh, you know, and having a, a blood sugar spike rather, and needing to constantly keep that at this level. And to do that, you need to be eating donuts and candy and all different kinds of things that are terrible for you, frankly, and that you probably wouldn't choose to eat if you'd had a good night's sleep, but are so easy and accessible to you as a result. I think that that's, I think poor decision making probably is a large so part of it. It's, it's a wonderful question because it is very foundation. Sleep is how our body and our brain audits what's going on. And just to get to address the weight gain, which is clearly linked to, to insomnia or inability to sleep normally, there are four major craving centers of the brain. We crave food, we crave water, we crave sex, and we crave sleep. Now, that's one of the reasons we always tell you to drink water when you get hungry, because you can't separate hunger and thirst usually. They actually are very similar sensations, and you'd be surprised how often you'll actually drink water and you won't feel hungry anymore. The sex part, you work out yourself. But, uh, the, but the sleep one is an important one, because when we don't sleep, we actually crave carbohydrates in particular. Because carbohydrates, carbohydrates stimulate insulin release, which stimulates and by the way, you need insulin to get chemicals across the brain uh, blood barrier. And so it's what we actually will normally crave and we will get if we don't sleep normally, which is why people who don't sleep the normal seven to seven and a half hours you recommend will generally begin to gain weight. Now, the reason I say it's an internal audit is you don't sleep well for three fundamental reasons. You don't sleep well because you don't understand sleep hygiene, which is the, the, the mechanics of sleep. The fact that when the lights go down at night, when you're outside, which is what all our ancestors always experienced, your, the, the pineal gland in the middle of the brain will start secreting melatonin, which is, a, of course, a, a supplement you can take, but you actually secrete it in high doses in your brain. And that melatonin makes you drowsy. So simple things like turning the lights down half an hour before you go to bed or listening to audio tapes instead of going on the Internet are, are tools that are very valuable. And there's a slew of others I can go through, but beyond the scope of today's discussion. That's number one. You don't understand sleep hygiene. Number two... Uh, is you have some physical ailment that prevents you from sleeping. Sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, uh, aches and pains, allergies. There are many reasons. Things that may not bother you much during the day, but they hold you up at night when you're it's all by yourself looking towards the ceiling. And, and the third thing that holds you back is depression, uh, or more importantly, it's not really depression, but an uh, inner re realization that things aren't the way they need to be. And that's why, amazingly, the best way to sleep well if, if you're having long-term insomnia problems is, is through counseling psychological counseling, because the sleep medications that we use, which are good crutches for short periods of time, especially if you're jet lagged or something like that's happening, or for acute crises, they're not great long-term solutions. And yet we rely on them as crutches when we know all the data supports, getting off them when we can, and focusing on the deeper reason why you're not able to get the sleep you want. So some folks would then get into your second question, resort to alcohol, which is a depressant. And so alcohol will let you go to sleep, but as it wears off, you'll wake up. So the typical story is, you, you can't sleep, you drink a little, you know, take a shot of alcohol, fall asleep, you wake up at 3 in the morning. Now you're really in trouble. And, I, and th those are the kinds of uh, realities that kids begin to experience as they first leave home. And of course, it, it, it stimulates an adult uh, problem as well because it becomes the norm that you don't sleep appropriately. Now, we're going to go through and get some tips from you guys. So, uh, just talking about my, Lisa, who's... Sure. Can you have the mic to my wife here? That's why they want to hear you in the back, though. She's going to shout at me now. <laughs> so I didn't say it today because I wanted to be polite. Can I say this? No. Right. Um, <laughs> could you address uh, briefly involvement with Health Corps, the foundation you started to combat so childhood we, obesity? We mentioned Health Corps very briefly, but that, when, when thinking on, on this work, uh, I had actually gone to school, to her school, to talk to some of the kids. Uh, about their bodies. And I went with some of the things we put on the Oprah show. I brought the organs and I, you know, comes from fun animations. I just sort of had a good time. And I went home that night and I, I wasn't sure if they got anything. It's so hard to talk to kids, I find, because, you, you know, they're not impressed by who you are. You got to prove yourself today. And then sometimes you're not quite sure if they've been listening to you, and, but you're pretty sure they're not. And so I went home and then the next day, by the time I got to work, I'd gotten calls and emails from some of the top leaders in Manhattan of civic society, you know, business leaders, you know, people that you don't, you know, we don't get to talk to all that much, asking if what I taught their kids was really true. So what had happened was the kids had gone home and talked to their parents. And they'd say, I'd said, for example, that when you have a piece of white bread, it's like having a Snickers bar, which happens to be true. 
And so, because, you know, when, you, when, you, when it hits your stomach, it turns to carbohydrates. Simple carbohydrates goes right to your liver. Your liver has to do what it can with it, and so on, so on and so forth. So I began to have this, this insight that people were having conversations going way beyond the classroom. So working with Daphne and, and Lisa and others, we began to think about how we would do this. And right about that time, I had operated on a 25-year-old woman for coronary blockages. She was a young Latino lady who had been overweight uh, and was a, a sort of the vanguard of this burgeoning obesity epidemic that we now have recognized is go growing at 50% faster than it is in adults. And we knew that at the time, and I had been to numerous national panels and forums trying to address this, that half of the kids of Hispanic origin in this country who are born this decade will be diabetics, 40% of little black boys and girls, and about a third of whites. So we knew there was an issue out there. The question is, how do you actually address it? And there was no game plan for it because ultimately kids need mentoring. That's how they change their behaviors. They're not going to change it because we create a white paper on it. And so taking some of the stuff Daphne was writing, we worked together on this. We created a program called Health Corps, which is like the Peace Corps. But instead of going off and putting kids in Africa to, to, to help in, in poverty-stricken areas, which is a very noble thing to do, we put kids who didn't want to do that in the high schools in this country to teach high schoolers a few years younger than them about what to eat to stay healthy, how to exercise to tune your body. And I mentioned earlier the mental resilience to be able to deal with the, the, the challenges they will face in their lifetimes. And the program has grown quite dramatically now, but it grew out of a basic insight, which is the best person to teach a kid about their bodies is probably another kid. So what we need to do is find that army and train them, which is what we do in Health Corps. And then they go out and they train the other kids, who then train the other kids. And we recognize that the true communication doesn't happen when we tell something to our kids. It happens when something clicks to them, and they can tell others in their lives what they've learned. That's why the, the impact of sibling uh, pressure on taste buds, for example, and food preferences and the like becomes so profoundly important. And these experiments have been well vetted, but we just need more people like all of you out there doing it in all of our communities. Because this isn't going to work because we legislated from Washington. I mean, all, you know, Tip O'Neill used to always say that all politics was local. Well, all healthcare is personal. It's only going to work because we do it in our own families. So let me now ask, uh, you can, please put your hands if you've got more questions, but let me just ask, we've got just a few minutes left. Tips, key tips you got when you're leaving home. You can be, you know, college kids, you know, senior citizens, anybody in between. Thoughts? Yes, sir. There's a, there's a yeah, there we have. Mike's coming at you. Hi, my name, hi, my name's Rob Itner. Um, I think one of the key tips that I got, I left home before college. I went to a boarding school, so years, this was obviously years ago. But uh, ever since I can remember growing up, my family, and Daphne touched on this, was that food was a very conscious thing. And the meal period was sacred. It wasn't eating in front of a TV. It wasn't, it was sitting down at a dinner table, even breakfast. And through my high school career, which was boarding school and through college, I can remember taking that on to those time periods. And dining was a sacred experience. It was, you know, I went to the breakfast, I went to the lunch, I went to the dinner. So I think that was a, a tip that my family passed on to me. Yeah, it's a great one, too. kind of kept me healthy. And you know, with all the risk factors of childhood obesity, it's probably the most important one, which is why uh, I was struck. We did a survey in one of the schools in northern Manhattan, and we asked the kids, if you could, would you rather spend the night at school? The overwhelming answer was yes, because they didn't have stable homes. And so when kids would rather stay at school than go home, you, you know you've got a big issue. Other thoughts, big tips. You, 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 don't be bashful out there now. Just get three more on it's one. Oh, there we are. And with the mic to boot. That's right, with the mic. Um, my tip came from my dad. He suggested that I start a positive credit rating with a credit card company and balance every month. And it really, you know, I, I've had two relationships with two brands since college, and I went to college in 1987. One with American Express, and I've continued to keep that and the other with Bank of America. And it's interesting, I've switched brands and things that I've eaten, things that I've bought, things that I wear, but I've maintained those two uh, financial relationships since college. That's so. a very, wow. very good bit of advice he gave you. And I trust a little bit, in the middle there's a uh, point there. there uh, there's one over here as well, if we have to get our mics moving around. The, uh, it was, it's, it's interesting, the role of financial uh, prowess uh, in our lives, because it just reflects how we deal with other things, but it's much more tangible. And someone keeps track usually, even if your parents don't, which is one of the reasons it's such a cool metric to, to keep track of how kids are doing. Yes, ma'am. 
Mine was actually at the college. <clears throat> when I went to Smith on the first day, they give you an honor code thing that you sign. And there you can take your exams anywhere on campus with your friends. And they have you commit on paper that you will be honest and that um, if you don't see something. And in medical school, when I took my boards, they follow me into the bathroom to make sure I'm not <laughs> cheating. So I'm just saying it was really interesting to think that you can trust a college student who's 18 but not a physician taking their boards. Um, so anyway. Can, can, can I just say one thing? It's yes. very interesting. When you look at, remember I talked today about professionalism? When you look at predictors who are not going to be good professionals, that's the number one way. Kids who cheated in school. So when they gave me that piece of paper, I had always been monitored. I did occasionally cheat out of laziness in high school. I sat there with that, and I said, from this point forward, I'm my own determiner of what I do. There's no one watching me. There's no father. There's no mother to decide. And I used to sit there, and I knew I was going to fail a physical chemistry test. And my backpack was there, and my friend was there. And I could have done it, but I never crossed that line because somebody expected more from me and put it out to me. So that was the college. That's great. There was a young lady there. Yeah. Um, ever since, I mean, I guess for as long as I can remember, my dad w would say to me, remember your name. No matter where I went, no matter what I was doing, whether it was going to be at school, whether I was going out with friends, even when I left for college, it was always his advice to me was to remember your name and remember where you came from and, and what we've taught you. And that has stuck with me ever since. And I, and I still do always remember my name because he told me that from you know, when I was eight years old. That's great. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. The, uh, you, you had some tips that you had in the book that sort of uh, going away presents parents can give them as they head off to school. Well, I think, I think that um, when, you come into co when you come into college campuses, you want a couple of touches of home. So I you know, brought my things like that. Um, but I think some of the appliances you can buy your kids are a popcorn popper. Um, I think that it's a snack that people can get away with and it's not, I mean, especially if you don't add a ton of butter and salt and all these things, it's fairly healthy and quick and satisfies that salty craving that you might have. Um, a rice cooker was actually something that was probably the most useful thing I bought my entire career at Princeton because I could make soups in it, I could make rice dishes, I could make lentils, I could make tons of different vegetarian things that I had grown up on all with this tiny little pot. And my campus was really stringent about not having the open surfaces of heat, so it, was, it actually met their requirements. Um, a coffee maker, save a lot of money on no $4 Starbucks lattes. And um, a blender. And you know, kids might use it for margaritas or something, those kids. Um, but well, not I, you, <laughs> but not Daphne. <laughs> We didn't use my blender for margaritas. <laughs> um, but, but I think that you can whip up smoothies in the morning. You, once you have those, those three basic things, popcorn is sort of a, um, a, you know auxiliary but was fun. Um, the three basic ones, you can make such a variety of dishes for, for any number of meals that I really think it encourages kids to start experimenting with, hey, you know, I really like this taste. Why don't I add it to, uh, you know, I really, like yogurt, I really like honey. I can add them together and make a nice smoothie and put some fruit in. And you begin to get servings of fruit. You want, you know, begin to get servings of vegetables. I would make gazpacho in my blender. I mean, things that just, you get kids thinking about providing for themselves and, and eating healthily and creating stuff from scratch. And it really goes a long way. Well, you know, we talk a lot about uh, childhood obesity, but there are two reasons why I think it's important for us to focus on it. One is uh, that we, when we lack health in the youth, we are actually are mortgaging our nation's future, which is what I think we're doing right now. Because it's going to cost us so much to deal with these issues as these children mature have a chance to, 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 to run a country, the least we've been handed uh, to, uh, for, by, by our parents through. And I think too often we don't recognize that kids are the future. They always have been, they always will be. And if we don't make that investment in a meaningful fashion, which takes time as well as money, then uh, we'll be paying the price together with them uh, as we go into our waiting years. The other thing I did not realize about kids when I started this process, and I mentioned it very briefly earlier, is how, impact, in, how impactful they are at viral marketing. Because for the same reason that marketers go after them, which is that kids will translate information, knowledge, to action like that, as opposed to adults that, you know, you develop your brand of, of detergent pretty quickly in life, and then you don't change again. But the kids develop that brand preference because people go after them because they will adopt new, new preferences. If we go after kids and teach them how to do it right, they'll go into their homes and audit their refrigerators. They'll teach their parents who often don't know how to do it either, and they'll exchange that information with their peers and with their siblings. And for that, it's a big bang for the buck. 
And I think that's why uh, this session was important for, for us to be involved in. I, and I uh, thank you all very, very much for carving out a little time spent with us. Take care. Thank you.